Grand Canyon National Park in northern Arizona is one of the world's great scenic treasures. This place is a marvel of nature, a geological wonder with no rival on Earth. If the name seems ordinary, if the word grand is overused, here its real meaning is disclosed on all sides. This is America's most popular western park. People come here from all over the world to view its sweeping vistas, its colorful towers and buttes, its awe-inspiring vastness. There can be gentle moments here too, when the canyon seems to belong to you and the wind alone. Purely from the standpoint of statistics, Grand Canyon is immense. It measures over 270 miles in length. At its widest point, it's as much as 18 miles across, from South Rim to North Rim. In places, its depth is more than a mile. The colors of the entire rainbow are here, and they shift constantly, imperceptibly during the day as the sun moves across the sky. Weather, too, alters the canyon's colors and varies the visual impressions it creates. Once you start to focus on the rock formations, their shapes and details, it somehow seems easier to view the canyon as even more than splendid scenery. Youngsters delight in recognizing familiar forms among the canyon temples and spires. This one is called Duck on a Rock. Grand Canyon is something like an open chapter in a textbook on geology. The story of its creation is complex, and scientists are still looking for answers to many questions. Grand Canyon Village is the heart of visitor activity at the South Rim. There's a great variety of lodging and dining facilities here as well as shops, campground, and virtually all necessary services for travelers. From the village, scenic drives lead east and west along the rim. There are some restrictions for private vehicles during the busy months. A series of overlooks, all located on rocky points jutting out into the canyon, give panoramic views that are breathtaking in scope. A visitor would have to spend a very short time here indeed without discovering that the full canyon story is not simply one of bright colors and sun-drenched cliffs. However, sunlight does play an essential role in displaying the canyon in its many varied aspects. For example, look at a scene with the sun behind you. You see lots of color, but there's almost no sense of depth, and the formations seem vague in shape, even flat. But with the sun at one side, canyon formations stand out in sharp relief. Shadows enhance the towers and temples, and they recede row on row to the horizon. Grand Canyon can also be a brooding landscape, and this quality is among its greatest charms. It's seen and painted as a blend of profound atmospheric shadows and vivid sunlight, majestic and stately but sun and clouds create an infinitely varied ambience. Canyon moods are rarely somber for long. Sometimes the place is filled with high spirits, gleeful and almost giddy. Cloud shadows dancing up and down the cliffs and buttes present a scene so enchanting it's nearly hypnotic.
An overlook only a few steps west of the village presents a dramatic view of Bright Angel Trail. This route is used by Grand Canyon's famous mule trips and is also popular with hikers and backpackers and with the local wildlife as well. A favorite destination is Indian Garden, about nine miles round trip from the trailhead on the rim. It's a pretty green spot, cool and shady, and it somehow seems secluded. Those who head down here on foot have to keep in mind that it's an elevation gain of 3,000 feet back up to the rim. Abundant wildlife is a special pleasure for visitors. An overlook at Hopi Point on the West Rim Drive offers some classic canyon views. Calendar shots, as photographers often call them. Hermit's Rest marks the terminus of the West Rim Drive, about eight miles from the village. The fanciful design of this cheerful stone retreat, built in 1914, is as picturesque as its name. The Colorado River is in sight from several overlooks on both West and East Rim drives. Its great beauty and its geological significance can be appreciated from the rim, but what's it like close up? Rafting on the Colorado River at Grand Canyon National Park is offered by a number of concessioners. Trips may last from three days to three weeks, and they vary widely in the range of white water the rafters encounter. There are trips for every taste and skill. All afford a memorable river level experience that adds a new and stimulating dimension to the visitor's perception of the canyon. It doesn't take long for those new to the river to discover that the dominant direction here is up. Making camp along one of the river banks is exciting in itself. If the fun of rafting hasn't created an appetite, surely the campsite setting will. Besides, there's work to do. It's a pleasure just to pull off the rafting gear and relax. Next morning, while most of the canyon is still in shade, the party is already keyed up for the surprises ahead. New rafters learn quickly that in Grand Canyon at least, the Colorado is seldom glassy smooth for very long. White water isn't the only fun to be found on a rafting trip. There's a chance to see natural beauties that are missed by those who remain on the rim. In exploring some of the secret side canyons and creeks, there's little time to consider the completely different perspective that earlier river explorers may have had in similar places. Even so, there's still the overwhelming conviction today, too, that this is truly an extraordinary adventure. In Grand Canyon, fully qualified and experienced rafters and kayakers can enjoy some of the most rugged white water thrills to be found anywhere in the country.
Grand Canyon developed into the intensely popular national park it is today because it's one of Earth's supreme natural wonders. But public interest had to have a beginning, a person or event that attracted attention to this place. Here, as it happens, both the person and the event are inseparably linked in American history, and their extraordinary story takes us back to the Colorado River. Major John Wesley Powell had been a Union officer in the Civil War and was wounded so severely that his right arm had to be amputated. In 1869, he and a small group of brave men made the first known boat trip through Grand Canyon. Powell's purpose was to make a scientific survey of the canyons of the Green and Colorado Rivers. This was unknown country then, an empty area on contemporary maps. The Powell expedition set out from the Union Pacific's Green River Station in Wyoming Territory on May 24, 1869. In describing an area within the present park, Powell wrote, once more the walls close in and we find ourselves in a narrow gorge the water again filling the channel and being very swift. There were calmer stretches of river between the rapids, and the party found sandy banks where they could pull their boats ashore. The men set up camp, ate sparingly from their dwindling food supply, and rested from the work of fighting the angry waters. At several points, Powell and some of his team climbed up the rugged rock walls to the canyon rim. This was not an easy task for a man with one arm. Three of the party, exhausted and fearing unknown terrors yet to come, left the group. They vanished without a trace. Powell persevered in his scientific studies, making detailed measurements of elevations and distances and analyzing the vast array of geologic data he assembled. In his publications later, his gift for elegant wording and his respect for the wonders of the canyon appear on every page. The traveler on the brink, he wrote, looks from afar and is overwhelmed with the sublimity of massive forms. The traveler among the gorges stands in the presence of awful mysteries, profound, solemn. Both on his first river expedition and on a second shorter canyon survey three years later, Powell visited a number of Indian villages of the area. He learned a great deal about the surrounding country, but far less about the canyon and the river. Here, Powell and his men were on their own. Instinct and courage were their only guides. John Hillers was one of the photographers who accompanied Powell on his second expedition. In spite of heavy equipment and the necessity of chemically coating their own glass photographic plates, these artists recorded scenes of astonishing beauty and significance. Major Powell's study of the canyon geology was intense and unending. He had an armchair rigged in one boat. During stretches of calm water, this provided a suitably high perch for observation and note-taking. The first Powell survey covered over a thousand miles of the Green and Colorado rivers. The men endured 95 days of privation and peril. The Major, in both popular and scientific accounts of his expeditions, described peoples and scenes that outsiders had never dreamed of. His exciting narratives are among the classics of American exploration and adventure. Today, an overlook on the South Rim is named for Major Powell. It provides a fine view of a stretch of the Colorado River, a hint of the unimaginable dangers that he and his teams confronted. The Powell Memorial is located here, honoring their achievements and the Major's pioneering contributions to the study of canyon geology. It's gratifying to look at the memorial and sense the roar of savage waves and respond to the twisting surge of the boat. Major Powell's direct descendants are today's whitewater travelers. He would surely envy them for their equipment. He'd fully appreciate their skill and he'd salute their every triumph.
Major Powell's writings had a completely unforeseen effect. They aroused a wide popular interest in a natural marvel that was virtually inaccessible. Well before the publication of his definitive account of the expeditions, one book on scenic America devoted its first chapter to the wonders of the Grand Canyon. Its eastern illustrators exaggerated the scenery of a place that was infinitely dramatic in reality. But the only significant fact was that increasingly more people wanted to come here. For as long as 11,000 years, Grand Canyon had been known and even occupied for periods of time by early Indian peoples. Among the ancient man-made artifacts found in the canyon are small split twig figurines of animals dating from about 4,000 years ago. Their purpose isn't known, but they may have been used in hunting rituals. Major Powell was not the first outsider to come here. Centuries earlier, other newcomers had begun to trickle in. In 1540, part of the Spanish Coronado expedition, hunting for gold, were the first Europeans known to have seen the canyon. In 1857, the United States government sent an overland reconnaissance expedition here, and the first prospectors known to have entered Grand Canyon came in 1864. Most found little of value. However, following Major Powell's books about his river trips, the stream of canyon visitors began. Photographers learned early that they could make money selling pictures of the Indians of the area. Many were photographed, usually in exchange for a small fee. They were spruced up and posed according to the photographer's directions. Small tourist accommodations had been available before the Bright Angel Hotel opened in 1898. Despite the crowd here, the number of visitors still was not large. All that changed three years later in 1901. To our good fortune, the cause of the change can very nearly be duplicated a century later. Today, the Grand Canyon Railway carries passengers by vintage trains to the canyon to the famous old town of Williams, a distance of about 65 miles. The historic and handsome railway depot in Williams dates from 1908. It includes a locomotive museum, as well as a gift shop and concession stand. The Grand Train Trip to Grand Canyon starts here. In the past century or so, the countryside between Williams and Grand Canyon has changed very little along the route of the railway. The scenery is high desert scrub near the start of the trip, with an occasional ranch building here and there. Soon we've climbed higher, and conifer trees crowd close. The work of laying the tracks from the main line at Williams to Grand Canyon was begun by the Santa Fe Railway in the late 1890s, and the first passenger train arrived at the South Rim in 1901. These were lucky people indeed. Roads to the canyon were virtually impassable, although horse-drawn coaches were sometimes able to make the trek. By 1902, automobiles managed to reach the South Rim, and this one drove perilously close to it. But it was the coming of the railroad that popularized this great scenic marvel. Visitors arrived in rapidly increasing numbers, and within a few years, the Santa Fe had an entire fleet of trains here to cater to the travel pleasures of canyon sightseers. But as the 20th century advanced, the public in general grew more and more obsessed with the family car, and train travel everywhere fell out of favor. Even with the adoption of sleek, streamlined diesel locomotives in the 1950s, trains simply could not compete. Cars and tour buses crowded the park's well-paved roads, and the Santa Fe Railway 
was forced to discontinue passenger operations here in 1968. Happily, America's interest in the delights of train travel eventually reawakened. Max and Thelma Biegert bought the Grand Canyon line in 1989. New tracks were laid. The old cars and locomotives, both steam and diesel, were restored, and passenger service was revived. Now the line is thriving once again, and several classes of service are offered. Today, the arrival of the Grand Canyon Railway train at the El Tovar Hotel reunites two principal elements in the early history of the village. Much has changed around these old favorites. With the advent of the Santa Fe Railway in 1901, plans for a first-class hotel in the canyon were begun. The El Tovar, designed along the lines of an alpine lodge, opened in 1905. The Fred Harvey Company, the railway's sole concessioner, assumed its operation. The hotel quickly became an attraction in itself, and the lobby was a popular and famous gathering place for visitors. Today, the El Tovar's accommodations and cuisine are still among the finest in America. Opposite the hotel is Hopi House, one of the most interesting and striking attractions on the South Rim. This celebrated shop is a special favorite with visitors, and not only because of its crafts and its picturesque architecture. famous Hopi dancers in authentic costumes present traditional music and dances here. <laughs> Hopi House was designed by Mary Coulter, architect for the Fred Harvey Company. Her professional ideology was to fashion buildings that reflected local cultures and landscapes. Her inspiration was the ancient Hopi village of Araibi, northeast of Grand Canyon, and the oldest continuously inhabited settlement in the United States. Hopi House opened in 1902, one of the first curio shops at the canyon. A number of village buildings have long histories. Few go back farther than that of the Kolb studio. Ellsworth and Emery Kolb, brothers from Pennsylvania, began photographing Grand Canyon in the early 1900s. They went to great lengths and heights to shoot exciting pictures using a bulky Graflex camera. By 1904, they had built a tiny studio near the head of Bright Angel Trail. They took pictures of the mule riders as the group started down into the canyon and had them ready to sell when the same trip returned. The Kolbs also made movies of the canyon and the river. Few people had so far duplicated Major Powell's exploits on the Colorado. But by 1911, the dauntless Kolbs made their first of many boat trips through the canyon, shooting movies of the gorge and the wild whitewater rapids. The dangers were as real for the Kolbs as they had been for Powell, and when their movies were shown back east, audiences gasped at the ferocity of the river. The Kolbs contributed greatly to the growing public interest in the Grand Canyon. Their studio was expanded to include an auditorium. Here, their dramatic river movie was shown daily, personally narrated by Emery Kolb. <laughs> Today, from near the trailhead, the studio looks much like the original. But seen from across the nearby arm of the canyon, it's huge. It now includes a bookstore, exhibit hall, and gallery. Nearby, Lookout Studio provides a particularly advantageous viewpoint. This harmonious structure is also a Mary Coulter design. There's a variety of hotels in the village, too. Bright Angel Lodge offers fine accommodations, dining, and shopping. Over the years, as the village has steadily grown, it has hosted many famous guests. Perhaps it was President Theodore Roosevelt's visits that were most significant for the canyon, and indeed for the entire national park system. Teddy was an avid outdoorsman and conservationist. 
Leading a trip on a canyon trail, he was in his element. He made a famous statement here that will always echo the feelings of environmentalists everywhere. Keep this great wonder of nature as it now is, he said. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. Grand Canyon became a national park in 1919. Winter at Grand Canyon is a quiet time of year. Only the South Rim is open then, and facilities there are limited. The elevation is 7,000 feet, and winters are cold. Summer crowds are long gone. Many wintertime visitors see a virtually summer-like canyon framed by snow-laden trees, although snow may cover the ground even at river level. A park observation station is located at Yavapai Point, near the east edge of the village. There are exhibits and a bookstore. Ranger-led walks and talks are offered. Near Las Vegas. Four words. If you want to describe to somebody why this canyon is the Grand Canyon, and there's no other canyon like it, four words. Enormous proportions, colorful scenery. There is only one Grand Canyon. A single mammoth canyon divides the park into a south rim and a north rim. The shortest drive between the two rims is a distance of about 220 miles. The route offers a great variety of scenery from canyon and plateau landscape to forests of ponderosa pine. The north rim of Grand Canyon is so different from the south rim in feeling and aspect that it's often difficult to remember that the same canyon separates them. Here on the North Rim, we're 1,200 feet higher. The warm seasons are shorter. Winters are long and snowbound. And in fact, the North Rim is closed to visitors from about mid-October to mid-May. The average annual snowfall here is around 11 feet. Because many North Rim views are toward the shadow side of the canyon formations, their shapes sometimes appear to be bolder, and their size seems even magnified. A low sun often brightens only a few cliffs and buttes, isolating them and dramatizing their grandeur. For visitors who are well acquainted with the popular South Rim views, the North Rim offers an entirely new perspective of the canyon. Few hotels can boast a more dramatic location than Grand Canyon Lodge. It's perched directly on the rim of the canyon. Huge windows with vast panoramic views dominate both the dining room and the sunroom off the lobby. Today, it's hard to believe that the first official government exploration party reported in 1858 that the Grand Canyon region was, quote, altogether valueless. It seems intended by nature that the Colorado River shall be forever unvisited and undisturbed. Our lives are so much richer now since we've learned to appreciate and enjoy the scenic marvels around us. single point in the 24-hour period to do the work that the river is doing today. There's another one, though, that's a little bit further to the west that I'd like to talk about, and that's Crystal Canyon. And Crystal Creek flows through Crystal Canyon. 
And at the mouth of these types of side canyons are where rapids are formed on the Colorado River. They're formed by there are several outstanding overlooks on the North Rim just below the lodge. Bright Angel Point, surely one of the most dazzling views in the entire park, is within a short strolling distance. The developed area of the South Rim, opposite this point, is about 10 miles away. The only direct way to get there is on foot. The full trip down to the river and up the other side is a dusty, strenuous hike of well over 20 miles. There are many fine, closer trail destinations in the canyon, but remember, it's uphill on the way back. Bright Angel Point and the area near the lodge are the hubs of sightseeing activities at the North Rim. Van tours may be booked here for trips to outlying scenic overlooks. Here at Point Imperial, we're about 25 miles northeast of Grand Canyon Lodge. The most conspicuous landmark in this area is a thumb-shaped spire called Mount Hayden. It's composed of hard sandstone standing on a base of softer red shale. The North Rim's abundant wildlife is a special pleasure for visitors. It's true, however, that everyone must react to all creatures here with equal enthusiasm. North Rim visitors are usually most interested in the famous long-eared kaibab squirrels. They're found here on Arizona's Kaibab Plateau and nowhere else. These handsome mammals are easily recognized by their characteristic long tufted ears and bushy white tail. If you spot one of these fascinating and elusive animals, treasure the experience. And speaking of ears, those of the mule deer are pretty distinctive too. It's often possible to glimpse these wary animals in early morning or late evening. Not far south of Point Imperial, near the road, is a small prehistoric Indian ruin. This is one of many sites on both rims and down in the canyon, occupied before A.D. 1200 by early Pueblo Indians. Cape Royal is the name of the tip of a long plateau that juts far out into the canyon. Below this point, the Colorado River swings around in a wide curve to the west. The river somehow seems more accessible here than for most overlooks, but distances calm even this river's violent rages. Far to the south, the mountains on the horizon are the San Francisco Peaks near Flagstaff. The most eye-catching feature at Cape Royal is Angel's Window, a natural arch. Erosion has caused an opening in the limestone fin that projects out from the rim. A trail leads along the crest of the fin to a vantage point that gives you a real top-of-the-world feeling. Early or late in the day, it's pleasant to return to one of the overlooks to enjoy the special magic of sunrise or sunset at the North Rim. At these times, the air itself often seems to turn golden. Size and distance are less overwhelming, and Grand Canyon becomes a personal experience. Back on the South Rim again, the view from Yaki Point has us located on East Rim Drive once more. This is the terminus, the end point of still another delightful park excursion. The famous mule trip down to the very bottom of the Grand Canyon leaves from the trailhead near the village. The ride down is 11 miles long to Phantom Ranch, close to the Colorado River. Riders saddle up at the corral at the head of Bright Angel Trail. You don't need to be a seasoned rider because all the mules are carefully trained. 
Experienced wranglers will choose a suitable mount for each member of the party. The riders thread their way into the canyon. The trail drops down by an extended series of zigzags or switchbacks that reduce the steep descent to an easier grade. It's a long ride down, usually hot and very dusty. New riders may discover some muscles they didn't know they had, and even a chafed spot or two. After a descent that must have seemed perpendicular, the level plateau provides a welcome interlude of easier riding. The temperature has risen, and there is no shade. Well before we approach the river, our party has descended into a desert environment with a climate like that of northern Mexico. But we're nearing our goal. The mighty Colorado surges past close below, and the Kaibab suspension bridge is our route across it to the north side. The party crosses Bright Angel Creek, tumbling down to the north rim. And here, in a cool grove of cottonwood trees, is our destination. Phantom Ranch, with everything tired riders could wish for. The ranch has an intriguing name. A phantom is something that is or seems unreal. Perhaps a brief vision or experience. After all the effort it takes to get here, the ranch does indeed seem somewhat unreal. And most visitors here feel that their stay is altogether too brief. The ranch is located deep in Bright Angel Canyon, near where it opens onto the Colorado River, and it's accessible from both north and south rims. It was completed in 1922 and is still another Mary Coulter design, with stonework of uncut boulders from the river. One story says that she named the ranch after a legendary Indian phantom who arose from an underworld tribe and liked this splendid and secluded site on the canyon floor. Today there are cabin accommodations, a campground, limited groceries, and great family-style meals. You can get down to the ranch in one of three ways, on foot, by the mule trip, or by the river rafts. Your river level adventure will stay locked in your memory forever. Visitors high above on the overlook at Yaki have seen the canyon splendor. But as Major Powell said in different words, Unless they've hiked it, or ridden the mules or the rafts, they haven't fully experienced it. One important stop on the East Rim Drive is devoted less to scenery than to history, actually to prehistory. 
This is the Tusayan ruin and museum. The ruin is the remains of a small pueblo or village occupied three and a half centuries before the Spanish explorers arrived. The pueblo was built about A.D. 1185 by an early people now called the Anasazi, ancestors of the modern Hopi Indians. Tusayan was a U-shaped structure of eight rooms for living quarters and storage. In front of the pueblo was a round ceremonial chamber called a kiva. Careful excavation here has revealed its outline and floor plan. The pueblo was home for about 30 people. Access to the rooms was by ladders through entrances in the roof. The Anasazi had a game in the surrounding forests and grew corn, squash, and beans in gardens near the pueblo. Their farming plots too can be seen today. Of the more than 2,000 Anasazi sites found within the park, Tusayan is the most accessible. A fine museum nearby exhibits prehistoric artifacts from several areas. Not far from the eastern boundary of the park is Desert View, the last overlook on the East Rim Drive. In summer, this is often a fine place to watch a thunderstorm take shape across the canyon. The dramatic watchtower dominates the scene. This is still another coulter design built of local stone. Inside, a spiral staircase decorated with Hopi designs leads up to the Hopi room. On the walls, authentic ceremonial sand paintings are shown. Desert view, close to the park's east entrance, may be either the introduction or the finale to any visit. And in everyone's travels, the Grand Canyon story is an epic phenomenon. Petrified Forest National Park contains one of the world's largest concentrations of petrified wood. However, this is entirely a fallen forest. Huge logs of stone and countless broken chunks are strewn about on the ground in vast profusion. Spectacular areas of the painted desert are also included within the park boundaries. The Petrified Forest is a park service unit separate from Grand Canyon. It's located about 200 miles by road southeast of the South Rim and is easily accessible from Interstate 40. The climate and the landscape here today are greatly different from those of the distant past when these trees originally grew. About 225 million years ago, this was a broad tropical basin with many streams flowing through it. Exhibits in Rainbow Forest Museum at the south end of the park illustrate this primeval time. In that early period, the climate was damp. Trees almost 200 feet tall towered over an undergrowth of ferns and other plants. Large reptiles and amphibians roamed the area. 
But how did the great trees become petrified? The exact process isn't fully understood. As the trees died, they fell into streams and were soon buried with silt and mud. These sediments contained ash from volcanoes off to the south and west. The water dissolved silica out of the ash. This silica solution permeated the logs and crystalline quartz replaced the wood cells. The entire process of turning wood logs into stone may have taken a comparatively short time. The features of the park are accessible from a paved road running north and south. There are spur roads over loops to all important areas and sites are clearly marked. The petrified forest area was occupied by early peoples for a period of nearly 10,000 years. Evidence of their presence is found in many forms throughout the park. These are petroglyphs, literally stone writings, carved into the rock over a thousand years ago. The site is called Newspaper Rock, a huge block of sandstone whose flat surfaces are covered with natural dark mineral stain. The designs were pecked into the surfaces with stones, exposing the lighter unweathered rock underneath. Scientists have not determined the meaning of the carvings. There are geometric designs, representations of hands and footprints, images of animals and humans. Some suggest gods or spirits. This is partially excavated Puerco Pueblo or village. It was occupied through most of the 13th century and then again in the 14th. The Pueblo comprised about 100 rooms and enclosed a large courtyard. Agate House, partly restored, strikes most visitors as a far more impressive structure. Instead of the sandstone blocks that were used in the walls at Puerco, this building is made of chunks of petrified wood, originally cemented together with clay. The roof, too, has been restored. When Agate House was first built, the people were simply using the most readily available materials. But their work shows off the marvelous colors and textures of petrified wood in a way that greatly appeals to modern tastes. Blue Mesa, approximately in the center of the park, provides a paved trail among the convoluted badlands formations of the Painted Desert. Here, too, are some of the most bizarre features in the entire park. This is called a pedestal log. Each one is actually a section of a petrified log on top of a column of sandstone, isolated here by erosion. The rains of countless storms washed away the earth around the log. The soil under it, however, was sheltered from the elements and remains as a ridge or pinnacle capped by the log. Agate Bridge is a long log supported at each end, although erosion has created a gully under its middle section. The log forms a natural stone bridge. In 1917, it became clear that Agate Bridge might collapse under its own weight. The bridge was saved by building a lengthwise concrete support under the span. Inevitably, erosion is continuing to widen and deepen the gully. Sometimes erosion may leave a log in a startlingly precarious position. The arch of Keystone Bridge is cracked in such a way that its center forms a genuine keystone. The log is severely broken, but it's still a bridge. Farther south at Jasper Forest, banded cliffs rise above a broad plain strewn with petrified logs. Without question, Many of these logs rolled down from the mesa top or from its eroding face. Those that haven't yet tumbled to the desert floor will do so eventually, as successive rains undermine and loosen them. Long logs break eventually into shorter sections, short sections into fragments. Even the solid rock of petrified wood crumbles into colorful gravel sooner or later. The name of Jasper Forest is taken from a type of quartz that forms the largest part of these petrified logs. In color, 
Jasper is usually brick red or brownish red and has been valued as an ornamental gemstone for thousands of years. The Long Logs area of Rainbow Forest near the park's southern entrance is a highlight of any visitor's tour. All the logs in the park are from trees that are not directly related to any modern species. Visitors often come to the conclusion that the petrified trees broke into sections when they fell. But this is not the case. The process of petrifaction took place underground after the trees had fallen. The buried petrified logs were fractured by pressures and movements within the earth. A partly buried chunk of log may prompt the question, how many more logs are still buried underground? No one can guess. As time passes, more logs will be uncovered naturally by erosion. Exposed to sunlight again after a darkness that lasted 225 million years. Old Faithful Log behind Rainbow Forest Museum is the largest log in the park. The remaining 35 foot length of its trunk, though cracked, has not been displaced into separate sections. The weight of the present log is estimated to be 44 tons. Maybe it's here on the trail through the Long Logs area that an ancient Indian legend about this place might seem quite reasonable. It was said that these prostrate monarchs of the primeval forest were the shattered bones of a fallen giant. Today the vegetation here is immeasurably different and the native pronghorn scarcely measure up to the large early reptiles and amphibians. But who can doubt that there once were giants here?